This screencast is a lecture for Dr. Faustus. Theater productions are usually classified as either tragedies or comedies. Which of these is Marlowe's Dr. Faustus? Certainly there are elements of both in the play. Some scenes are incredibly dark and heavy, while others are goofy and light-hearted. Most students find those comedic interludes in the play jarring and out of place. Think about what the play would be like without them. Some scholars think that these scenes might have been added by a later playwright, while others contend that Marlowe wrote them into the play himself. In my opinion, both sides make good arguments. First and foremost, they do seem out of place in such a dark drama. I mean, Faustus is selling his soul to the devil for Pete's sake. The play would be so much more powerful without the comic scenes. On the other hand, you have to think about the, those Renaissance audiences that saw the play for the first time. Remember, Marlowe is the first writer to compose plays in blank verse, making the dialogue sound so much more realistic. Truth be told, many of those early audiences were terrified by this play. Some thought that actual devils appeared on stage and carried the actor playing Faustus off to hell. The comic scenes would have reassured them that they were watching a play, that it was all right and going the way that it should go. If you think about it, many horror movies today include humor in them. Some, like Scary Movie, really play up the comedy aspect, while more traditional horror movies are much more subtle. It might not be slapstick like we see in Faustus, but it's there in almost all of them nonetheless. Let's look at some, uh, let's look at some specific aspects of the play. First, there's Faustus's search for knowledge. I mean, that's at the heart of this whole play, isn't it? Is it wrong to want knowledge? Is there any knowledge that we shouldn't have? If so, what is it? The big question is where does morality come into play with knowledge? In other words, can we think of knowledge as either being moral or immoral? And if so, what makes it one way or another? When Dr. Faustus signs his soul over to Satan, his blood congeals. Even his own body is rejecting the agreement, telling him, don't do this thing. Does he so sell his soul cheaply, do you think? Look at the contract together. On these conditions following. First, that Faustus may be a spirit in form and substance. Secondly, that Mephistopheles shall be his servant and at his command. Thirdly, that Mephistopheles shall do for him and bring him uh, whatsoever. Fourthly, that he shall be in his chamber or house invisible, that he, meaning Mephistopheles. Lastly, that he shall appear to the said John Faustus at all times, in what form or shape soever he please. I, John Faustus of Wittenberg, doctor, by these presents, do give both body and soul to Lucifer, Prince of the East, and his minister Mephistopheles, and furthermore grant unto them that, twenty-four years being expired, uh, the articles above written in violet, full power to fetch or carry the said John Faustus, body and soul, flesh, blood, or goods, into their habitation wheresoever, by me, John Faustus. So this, um, he sells his, his soul for 24 years of this. Think about what uh, Faustus must think about eternity. Uh, 24 years is not very long. One would think that if somebody was going to go as far as to sell their soul, they would have gone for a lot more time than that. But this idea of selling your soul for something that you want badly appears throughout literature. Uh, because of Faustus, this agreement is called a Faustian bargain. It's easy for people to say that they'd never make such a bargain, but if you think about it, it could happen to any of us. On a totally philosophical level, we make such bargains all the, all the time when we cheat on an exam or on our significant other. We rationalize that the end justifies the means, just like Faustus does. We sell a little piece of our soul to get what we want. On a more literal level, is there anything, anything that you'd be willing to sell your soul for? Think about someone you love deeply who is suffering horribly. Would you be willing to do anything to help them? Would you sacrifice your soul for them? My dad actually did that for me. Um, he was in a church uh, when I was born, and 
I needed several blood transfusions to save my life. And the church that my dad belonged to doesn't believe in blood transfusions. And so the people in the church insisted that he let me die. Um, as you can see, he turned away from them and gave me a chance at life. He would rather chance eternal damnation and make what his church saw as a deal with the devil than see his baby daughter die in his arms. This idea of the Faustian bargain, then, is not such a clear-cut decision. Faustus's bargain, of course, was not based upon a matter of life and death, but of knowledge. Would that be worth it, do you think? Would anything be worth it? Anyway, we see Faustian bargains everywhere. In music, for instance, with the Charlie Daniels band, uh, The Devil Went Down to George, I think they were uh, dueling over a golden fiddle, if I'm not mistaken. We see it in movies like The Firm, people willing to sell their soul for a chance at the American dream. We see uh, Dr. Faustus in uh, graphic novels. Here he's been transformed into an evil character who fights against Captain America. There's even a Garfield cartoon uh, based on Dr. Faustus. And of course, The Simpsons. You just know that Bart is more than ready to make a deal. So anyway, getting back to the play. Faustus has grand ideas of what he'll do with power. Had I as many souls as there be stars, I'd give them all for Mephistopheles. By him, I'll be great emperor of the world and make a bridge through the moving air to pass the ocean with a band of men. I'll join the hills that bind the Afric shore, in other words, Africa, and make that land continent to Spain and both contributory to my crown. The emperor shall not live but by my leave, emperor being the emperor of Rome or the pope, nor any potentate in Germany. There was a German potentate pope at that time too. Now that I have attained what I desire, I'll live in speculation of this art till Mephistopheles return again. This is in scene three. So how do Faustus's ideas of what he'll do with his magical powers equate with the reality? What he ends up doing is little more than cheap tricks. He's like an illusionist or a magician. Certainly he does nothing worth selling his soul for. Every time Faustus asks for something from Mephistopheles, he's disappointed in the result. For instance, the very first thing he asks for is a wife, but Mephistopheles can't deliver on that because marriage is a holy sacrament of the church. He brings Faustus a she-devil instead. When Faustus asks about hell, Mephistopheles is very evasive. Whenever Faustus begins to recognize that he didn't get much of a bargain, mostly because of the angel-devil debate going on on his shoulders, he's given a book of some sort to distract him from that recognition. One of the distractions occurs when Lucifer attempts to turn Faustus away from thinking about Christ in scene 5, um, lines 263. Lucifer has the seven deadly sins performed for Faustus. He's doing everything he can to keep Faustus more interested in hell than in heaven. Faustus goes to Rome and plays tricks on the Pope. How does this compare to his fantasy about the power he would receive in exchange for his soul? Why is he doing all those godlike things that he imagined? One possibility is that the human mind is simply too limited in its scope. We can't really pull off the things uh, with the same complexity that God can. When you think about it, how much power has Faustus really gained through his bargain with the devil? All it seems he can do are small magic tricks. Mephistopheles seems to keep all the power to himself. So why doesn't Faustus just repent? What does he believe in? He says that he doesn't believe in hell, and you would think that he doesn't believe um, he doesn't because he's willing to chance spending eternity there. On the other hand, he must believe in Satan because he's willing to turn his back on God in exchange for the power that Satan can give him. It's just a really interesting question. So the play is so perfectly written that it contains a total of 13 scenes. Did you notice that? In that final scene, Faustus's time is running out. Open your book to page 492 and read Faustus's final speech along with me, starting on line 57. Faustus begins, Ah, oh, Faustus, now hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. 
Stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven, that time may cease and midnight never come. Fair nature's eye, rise, rise again, and make perpetual day, nature's eye being the sun. Or let this hour be but a year, a month, a week, a natural day, that Faustus may repent and save his soul. O lente, uh, lente curete, noctis eque, the stars move still, time runs, the clock will strike, the devil will come and Faustus must be damned. Oh, I leap up to my God. Who pulls me down? See, see where Christ's blood streams in the firmament. One drop would save my soul, half a drop. Oh, my Christ, I'll rend not my heart for naming of my Christ. Yet will I call on him. Oh, spare me, Lucifer. Where is it now? Tis gone. And see where God stretches out his arm and bends his ireful brows. Mountains and hills, come, come and fall on me and hide me from the heavy wrath of God. No, no, then will I headlong run into the earth. Earth gape. Oh, no, it will not harbor me. You stars that reigned at my nativity, whose influence have allotted death and hell. Now draw up Faustus like a foggy mist into the entrails of yon laboring clouds, that when you vomit forth into the air, my limbs may issue from your smoky mouths, so that my soul may but ascend to heaven. The clock strikes the half hour. Ah, half the hour is past. Twill all be past anon. O oh God, if thou wilt not have mercy on my soul, Yet for Christ's sake, whose blood hath ransomed me, impose some end to my incessant pain. Let Faustus live in hell a thousand years, a hundred thousand, and at last be saved. Oh, no end is limited to damned souls. Why wert thou not, why wert thou not a creature wanting soul? Or why is this immortal that thou hast? Ah, Pythagoras's meta uh, psychosis were that true. This soul should fly from me, and I be changed unto some brutish beast. All beasts are happy, for when they die, their souls are soon dissolved in elements. But mine must live still to be plagued in hell, cursed by the parents that engendered me. No, Faustus, curse thyself, curse Lucifer that hath deprived thee of the joys of heaven. The clock strikes twelve. Oh, it strikes, it strikes. Now, body, turn to air, or Lucifer will bring thee quick to hell. O oh, soul, be changed into little water drops and fall into the ocean never to be found. My God, my God, look not so fierce on me. Adders and serpents, let me breathe a while. Ugly hell, gape not, come not, Lucifer. I'll burn my books. And he ends with a scream. Ah, Mephistopheles. This is high drama. The other existing version of the text doesn't have the epilogue that follows this. So this is the way that the play uh, ended for some of those medieval audiences. Thinking about how shaken they must have been um, with the play ending with that scream, that cry of despair. So um, there you have it. There's Dr. Faustus. Many uh, I ideas, uh, philosophical ideas to think about because of this play. So I hope that you will talk about those in your discussion. Thank you.